Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And welcome everyone uh, online for the launch of uh, the IAS Lancet Commission on Health and Human Rights. The title of the report is Under Threat, the IAS Lancet Commission uh, on Health and Human Rights. And indeed, as we look across the landscape of 2024, the health and human rights efforts that so many of us have worked on for so many decades are indeed under threat. Just before we begin, uh, and I will introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Richard Horton, the, the uh, editor-in-chief of The Lancet, just a few housekeeping issues. Uh, we can't, unfortunately, open this up to a verbal a question and answer, but please do use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom uh, to put your questions in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat and we will be looking uh, for those questions. I'd like to make a special invitation to all of the commissioners. Uh, there were 23 of us on this Lancet Commission. Uh, and, the, and please, commissioners, uh, do weigh in, particularly if there are questions around the areas that you worked on in particular. Let me also just thank uh, the sponsors and supporters uh, of this multi-year undertaking, uh, which began actually before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and which we carried on through working virtually until we could finally meet face-to-face uh, -face in London about 18 months ago. Uh, first of all, the International AIDS Society uh, has supported this commission from the beginning. We greatly appreciate their support uh, and of course, uh, uh, Deba Kamarulzaman, a co-chair for this Lancet Commission, uh, is a past president of the International Aid Society. Um, secondly, uh, the resources of the Desmond M. Tutu Professorship at Johns Hopkins at the Bloomberg School of Public Health also helped support of this effort. Thirdly, uh, my former team at Johns Hopkins, my current uh, team at Duke, uh, and the communications teams from IAS, The Lancet, uh, Duke, and Johns Hopkins all work together uh, to really assure uh, what we hope will be uh, a wide-reaching and, and really vital launch for this effort. Uh, so we will start off with the keynote speech from Richard Horton. And let me just say by way of introduction that Richard has been a champion, a true global champion for the right to health, for access to health care for the most marginalized populations. And he has really used the extraordinary platform, the Lancet family of journals, to advance human rights and human dignity. And for that, we all owe him great debt of gratitude. So without further ado, uh, my great friend and uh, great colleague, Richard Gordon. Well, thank you very much, Chris. <clears throat> and uh, it's lovely to see you. I wish we were together. I remember some years ago sitting in your office, and I think that was when we uh, found common cause in thinking about how human rights influences health and how health influences human rights. And I think from that very first meeting, um, in fact, we could trace the origin of that commission to... Uh, to that first conversation when you were in your office in Baltimore. Um, let me just first formally thank you and Adiba as co-chairs of the commission and all the commissioners for researching and writing this. And I know I have a slight conflict of interest in saying this, but this important, because um, I do believe it's important and extremely timely report. I think if I stand back and look over the last 20 or 30 years um, of the intersection between the health community and the human rights community, I have to confess that we in the health community have sometimes had an ambiguous relationship with human rights. Uh, at the hopeful extreme, the positive extreme, human rights have been the foundation for several very important responses to health emergencies, such as, probably foundationally, the AIDS response. Remember Jonathan Mann, 
who, of course, argued that only by valuing human lives equally could one control an epidemic rationally. Um, and if you, it's it seems impossible to recall now, but I do recall, as many of you will recall, that in the early phase of HIV, the general response from so many was to condemn, mm. to discriminate, to stigmatize individuals, or worse, just groups of individuals. And the AIDS response, as Jonathan so powerfully argued, had to put human rights and human dignity center stage. And indeed, it's been that rights-based approach that has led to the saving of so many millions of lives. But at a more alarming extreme, I've also seen global health leaders, some very senior global health leaders, explicitly reject the idea of human rights, largely because of fear of offending certain governments, member states, who dislike human rights language. Part of the difficulty, I think, is that for some, human rights are seen as a kind of unattainable set of goals, even utopian goals, that are judged meaningless in the rough world of real politique. But as this commission shows, compellingly and convincingly, nothing further, nothing could be further from the truth. And let me take one example, and that is the right to the highest attainable standard of health. I would encourage everybody to read a document that doesn't sound very exciting, but is of profound importance to our work in the health community. And that is General Comment 14 from the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. It was published in 2000, and it set out the meaning of the right to health very clearly and very pragmatically. When we talk about the right to health, we don't mean the right to be healthy. When we talk about the right to health, we're not talking about some perfect utopia. We're talking about considering health in the context of a state's available resources. But the right to health includes not only the right to health care, but also extends to addressing the social determinants of health. General Comment 14 famously set out its AAAQ definition, the progressive realization of the availability, accessibility, acceptability, and quality of healthcare services. And it went on to state, incredibly important this, that a human rights-based approach to health demands non-discrimination and equal treatment, a gender-based approach to health, recognizing the different biological and social determinants of men's and women's health, and provided specific protections for children, adolescents, older persons, persons with disabilities, and indigenous peoples. But it went further than that still. General Comment 14 imposed obligations on governments to progressively realize these objectives. And so a human rights-based approach provides not just a framework for thinking about action, but also a framework for accountability, holding those with power accountable for their promises and their commitments. So let me reiterate, this commission could not be more timely. Because look at the world we are in today. As a human created famine threatens to engulf several me million people in Gaza, 
as conflicts and violence in Sudan, Myanmar, Ukraine, Ethiopia, the Sahel and Haiti destroy lives and livelihoods of millions of people. And as political leaders, governments and even courts worldwide are rolling back long held rights of some of the most vulnerable, oppressed and silenced groups in our society. So now is a moment to insist on the centrality of human rights, not only in health or global health, but also as a fundamental guiding set of principles for domestic and foreign policy, of which health forms such a substantial part. As the Commission concludes, this challenge to recenter our thinking, our actions, our debates around human rights, this challenge is daunting, but is not insurmountable. And so the work begins here, right now. So back to Chris to hear the manifesto for action. Chris. Well, thank you so much, Richard. Um, greatly appreciate that. And I think one thing we can all take away immediately is the focus on accountability. What we've seen, and unfortunately, uh, across so much of the landscape, the current moment has been impunity for rights violations and, and violators not being held accountable and rights holders losing rights uh, really without accountability. And that is absolutely a major focus of the commission. We're gonna turn now to uh, several slides. I will start off and then uh, my co-chair Adiba Kemaruzaman will uh, step in and I'll, I'll introduce Adiba at the end of this slide section, but she is going to focus on the recommendations, the calls to action uh, coming out of this work of the commission. So as you've heard, uh, the commission report is live today, uh, and uh, we will put a link uh, to the report in the chat. Um, it is uh, an extensive piece of work. We felt that that was important. Happily for uh, readers with less time, there is an executive summary that we think captures uh, most of the arguments, uh, and then certainly uh, the recommendations, which are, which are really key. I wanna talk a little bit about the process. These are the commissioners, uh, the team who worked on the commission. There are some additional co-authors on the full report, as you will see, those are mostly uh, people who helped with the modeling sections. But I wanted to just highlight here, in addition to Adiba and myself, the other people uh, who were commissioners uh, on this commission. We've been working for close to four years now. Uh, and this really began with scoping reviews, with looking at what was currently in the literature, with developing themes, and then working uh, as teams on specific areas. Uh, and one of the things I think that has really made this such uh, exciting and hopefully impactful work is that this is a truly interdisciplinary team. Uh, we have people from uh, medicine, from uh, mental health, from history, uh, from human rights and law, from environmental law, uh, from across uh, multiple continents, uh, from low and middle income countries and upper income countries. Uh, and of course, we have some spectacular modelers. I'm gonna show you some of their uh, work in a moment in which we used mathematical modeling to really interrogate some of these critical interactions of health and human rights. So a few brief framing remarks. First of all, uh, just last year, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights turned 75. So we are now 76 years into this era. And as Richard highlighted, the the use of the human rights paradigm or human rights approach to health has really led to some spectacular outcomes. Uh, and perhaps now is carried most, uh, most fully forward by the movement for universal health coverage. 
But while we were working on what would have been a Universal Declaration of Human Rights at 75 kind of report, the COVID-19 pandemic swept our world. And we very quickly saw, uh, starting with PPE and oxygen, some of the most basic aspects of care before we had vaccines and antivirals, really how little equity, justice, and the right to health played out in the distribution really played out was wealth, uh, was uh, where countries had the manufacturing and the capacity. And there were country after country where uh, simple things like putting someone on oxygen going into respiratory failure was impossible. And we saw, uh, unfortunately, rather than a global solidarity in the face of the pandemic, nationalism, uh, closing borders, anti-immigrant sentiment, and a plethora of disinformation and misinformation. We also understood, and, and this of course is the emerging as one of the great new challenges in global health, that the climate crisis is inescapable in thinking about the future of human health and indeed the health of all living things on the planet. Uh, but that here too, there is a rights and social justice aspect because the health impacts are being felt most powerfully by the people who did the least to contribute to the climate crisis, many of whom have contributed almost nothing uh, to the climate crisis, and yet they are paying the highest price. And that is an issue that we're going to have to address. Impunity for rights violations has become a new norm of war. And what we have seen, and the report really highlights, is a fundamental series of threats to the principle of medical neutrality, to the idea that the sick and the wounded, women in labor, children, the elderly, deserve special protection in conflict. Instead, what we've seen is widespread use of attacks on healthcare facilities, healthcare providers, even on ambulances, as a tool of terror and as a tool of war. And finally, we are in a period where the human rights consensus is being threatened by rising racism, by xenophobia, by anti-immigrant policies. And that all of these together threaten the human rights consensus and undermine all of our right to health. So that is where we began, looking at the problems. And then we asked ourselves three questions. These are the framing questions. So given what's happening in the world, what is the future of the health and human rights movement? How can the health and human rights framework be revitalized and reinvigorated to achieve the healthy communities we all want to see? And finally, what domains of the health and human rights framework are most relevant for ensuring robust health systems and universal access to care? And what I'm gonna do now is just very briefly go through each of the eight domains that we identified through the scoping reviews and through our process. Um, and first, I wanna just talk about the model. Obviously, there is a great deal of information uh, from the health literature, from human rights, uh, from what is happening across multiple disciplines and fields. And to make sense of all of this and be able to have a framework for addressing each of these eight domains, uh, we developed a socioecological model for health and human rights. The model is in the paper. Um, it may be a little hard for people to read it in detail, but let me just say that it centers at the center of the model, uh, each of us, uh, and the dignity that we share by virtue of our human status. It really places the individual and the human family uh, at the center of this model. And I think we can all agree that one of the aspects of the Universal Declaration, now 76 years old, is that that centering of human dignity at the heart of health and human rights and, and human rights more broadly hasn't changed. It needs to be reaffirmed and held up. And we all know and we feel and can see when dignity has been violated. And unfortunately, it is such a part of our world. The next level is the entitlements, the kind of basic uh, elements of, the, of a standard of well being, including things like access to healthcare, food, education, and now digital access that are necessary for a life 
uh, with rights protections and indeed. The third level out is the socioeconomic, commercial, and political determinants. And these, of course, play overwhelming roles in whether people are able to realize health rights. The most outer level, uh, uh, the next outermost level is governance. And of course, uh, governance plays a central role in the human rights environment. We have many, many governments uh, worldwide who are actively violating the rights of their citizens and the rights of citizens of other countries. Uh, and of course, this level is one that healthcare has not had a great deal of ability to uh, affect, but nevertheless, it's critically important. And finally, we have the global determinants. And I think there's no more clear global determinant right now uh, than the global determinant of climate change that is driving so much human migration and mobility and leading to an array of health threats. So that's the framework that we used. We hope others use it. We hope others refine it and work with it. We think that it's important to be able to really understand the multiple levels at which uh, health and human rights is affected. So moving on then, the first domain, uh, we, we wanted, we, we reviewed the available evidence and developed actionable recommendations. You'll hear about those actionable, rec actionable recommendations from Deepa. The first is pandemics. This of course is driven by the response to COVID-19, what we might consider a human rights failure and the response to HIV, which of course has been in many ways a glowing success but really to focus on equitable access to essential interventions for everyone. The second was the climate crisis and the health and rights implications. The third, conflict, displacement, migration, and refugees, uh, an enormous topic, but one also inextricably linked from the climate crisis. Structural racism, inequality, and discrimination against devalued minorities are a persistent and ongoing threat to the realization of health rights. Uh, and uh, we had, a, a, I think, a very powerful section focusing on this. And of course, uh, this is relevant for many, many countries, including my own, the United States. Sexual and reproductive health and rights emerged as a critical area, as it did, uh, as Richard noted, in 2000, in the general comment 14 uh, of the, of the um, Convention on Social, Cultural, and Economic Rights. And of course, this is a domain where we are seriously under threat in many countries. Misinformation and disinformation also emerged in COVID, although they have been around before in forms of vaccine hesitancy, uh, in misinformation and the deliberate spreading of falsehoods, uh, which undermine this very fundamental right to benefit from science that actually is in the Universal Declaration. Artificial intelligence, we came to uh, somewhat later in the process when we realized that indeed AI, for all of its potential to help uh, humanity, uh, is emerging in many domains as a threat to health and a threat to human rights. And we felt that we had to include it. And then finally, the economic and commercial determinants of the right to health. Thinking about things like big sugar, palm oil, uh, highly processed foods, the extraordinary financial forces that we are up against, particularly in low and middle income countries around uh, trying to improve health. Now, I'm going to move now to the three models that we developed to explore some of these. And the first of these was led by Natasha Martin and her team at the University of Southern California. And what they wanted to do was to see if it would be possible to quantify the impact of disinformation on COVID. Uh, they used data from Texas uh, and they used data from infections and deaths. It turned out that misinformation was being widely spread and unevenly spread in Texas based on the media and social media that people were paying attention to. So what they used actually was data uh, uh, on misinformation and disinformation from social media platforms and basically looked at three scenarios. 
the status quo, so what actually happened, which was the active spread of disinformation, misinformation, uh, if misinformation among Republicans equaled that of Democrats, what would the death disability look like? And what would have happened if there was no misinformation? And what you can see here is the outcomes. Um, basically, uh, what you, uh, if you can, can see the figure, uh, but it's essentially that uh, a great deal uh, more misinformation and disinformation was being shared on Republican social media platforms. So uh, about 52% of COVID deaths could have been prevented in Texas. That amounts to 9,000 people if misinformation had been equally spread on Democratic and Republican platforms. Uh, if there was no misinformation, 75% of infections and 87% of deaths, that's 15,000 people, uh, would have been spared. So here you see very clearly uh, the morbidity and mortality impacts that misinformation and disinformation can have. And there's an online appendix where these models are uh, put out in greater detail. Next. Now, uh, Peter Vickerman and his group at the University of Bristol looked at another group, uh, and this is a, a very important marginalized population, uh, which is uh, women who sell sex, or trade sex in the UK. And they looked at the impact of homelessness and police displacement uh, uh, and violence uh, among sex workers. It turns out, unfortunately, that this population, these women, face an extraordinary array of violence. Between 19 to 44 percent of sex workers experienced physical violence in the past year, the data that they were using. And violence turned out to be related, of course, to health and social inequalities, including poverty, homelessness, racial inequalities, and drug use. And the criminalization of sex work was associated with a three times higher odds of violence in other studies. So it, they used a parent study in East London, participatory mixed method study on how police enforcement affects sex workers' health and access to services. And it's a dynamic model of violence among street-based sex workers. And what you see basically is the baseline, 75% of sex workers expressing recent, experiencing recent violence. If you try and impact homelessness, you do get a significant decline, uh, but only to about half of sex workers experiencing violence. If you uh, stop police displacement, you also get a somewhat modest decline in violence. If there's neither homelessness nor police displacement, you get a dramatic drop, a 66% decline in the experience of recent violence. And what this tells you is that the punitive laws and practices of the police and the social determinants for these women are interacting to create uh, such a lethal situation. I think we could all agree that no population should experience this level of violence. The last model is again looking at a police uh, program, but this is looking in Mexico, in Tijuana on the US-Mexico border, at a police program on HIV and overdose outcomes among people who inject drugs. This was led by Javier Cepeda, uh, my former group at Hopkins and his colleagues. The background is that policing behaviors, which involve things like confiscating needles and syringes because they are used for injection drug use and arrests were associated with uh, HIV and overdose risk in Tijuana, Mexico. This had been well, uh, well demonstrated. To respond to this, uh, police officers over 1800 in Tijuana received public health and human rights education program to align policing with public health practice. And what's important is that Mexico had decriminalized personal use of many of these substances, but the police had not been trained in how to respond to these new laws. So this group did a mathematical model to estimate the impact and cost effectiveness of what an education program 
in health and rights for police might do on incidents and overdose. And basically you're seeing a pre and post analysis here, the probability of injectors uh, being jailed or spending time in detention. And you can see in the pre-training, it's very high uh, up to about half uh, at any given time. During the training, a real decline, and in the post-training period, a very significant decline in arrests. But most importantly, uh, modest declines in HIV, it always takes time to see declines in HIV incidents, but a 12% reduction in fatal overdose, which of course has surpassed HIV as the major cause of death for people who inject opiates worldwide. Uh, so this is really a very important finding, and it shows us, I think, a very practical application of how we can use improving human rights to address the outcomes that we really care about, like overdose and HIV. And by the way, it was very cost effective. Uh, let me then turn, uh, those are the models we wanted to share with you, and, uh, and of course, they're models, but nevertheless, we think that they really help us interrogate the actual on the ground interactions of health and human rights. Next up um, is my co-chair, uh, the distinguished leader uh, in public health and global health infectious disease physician, Adiba Kamarulzaman, who is now uh, the provost at Monash University in Australia. She previously was the first woman to be Dean of the University uh, of Malaysia Medical School in Kuala Lumpur. And she's going to share with us the outcomes, uh, the recommendations of the report. So, Adiba, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris, and good evening from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, everyone. So, how can health and human rights be revitalized to achieve health for all was one of the framing questions um, that we had. And the commission, as you heard, examined um, and, and focused on the eight domains. Um, and we've come up with, with these recommendations. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay. The recommendations that I'm going to share with you um, shortly are guiding principles or the overarching goals that we hope to achieve. But within the eight domains um, that Chris just outlined are also very specific goals um, in, in each of them. There are um, between three and four specific goals uh, in, in the domains that um, individuals could work towards, but also um, organizations and, and global um, institutions. Now let's turn to the overarching goals and recommendations um, that we rec that, that we are put, putting forward. And firstly, as you heard, through the crises that we're all living through right now, if we are to achieve health and well-being for all, and indeed, uh, as uh, many of our commissioners have um, through the four years that we have been working on this report over and over again stress, actually for the survival of humankind and the, the planet, what we must do is to recenter human rights to achieve um, these goals. And as Richard uh, mentioned in his opening, we in the health field um, have had a rather ambiguous relationship with human rights. And so to recenter human rights to achieve the health and well being for all, it is, hard, it is us in the health field, in the health community, that first and foremost need to recenter human rights in our own health practice and work with other partners and champions in other fields to achieve these goals. Now, the next one may be a bit aspirational, but indeed, if we are um, to tackle those difficult global challenges, what we must work towards is the transformation of the international order and global governance and to accelerate the decolonization of global health. And with that, we must ensure anti-racism serves as a central pillar to revive and strengthen health and human rights. Through the 
HIV AIDS pandemic. I think our community has uh, been exemplary in trying to ensure equitable representation of people from uh, communities as well as regions and um, to include communities and civil society in uh, discussions and, and uh, particularly in health sector reforms um, if we are to achieve um, this um, health and well-being for all, particularly for those most marginalized. And finally, we will not be able to achieve our goals unless we review and undertake legal policy and programmatic changes across the eight domains of the Commission. And you've already heard just then from Chris how um, bad laws um, have a huge impact on um, the health of the population. Next slide, please. And so more specifically, what we call upon is all health practitioners and stakeholders must reaffirm that healthcare is a human right. And uh, again, you heard from Richard how um, this has been articulated several decades ago. Secondly, we have to mainstream human rights, and that means we must educate our young um, medical students and doctors about the importance of human rights and include it in health education. And thirdly, all of us must critically examine how we can contribute to centering human rights in our work, whether it's, to measure, whether it's measures to reduce health inequities, and how we can address social determinants of health and how we can actively combat health disinformation. We must also be health advocates and promote health and human rights at national, district and municipal levels and provide the leadership and support development of multi-sectoral local coalitions to promote practical actions against racism, gender inequality, criminalization, and of course, to promote environmental justice, access to not just um, uh, medications, but also healthy diets and safe housing, and to provide a safe and welcoming space for all displaced persons, including uh, migrants and people who have fled war or civil conflicts. Next. There's more for the health field to do. And in order to achieve um, some of these difficult uh, challenges, so we, to overcome some of these difficult challenges, of course, we uh, can't work alone. We cannot work alone. And we must actively partner with other movements who share common causes for of human dignity, equity, survival, and justice. Um, we must partner those working in climate justice, women's health issues, racial and mig migrant justice, and, and those um, that we've listed here in this slide. Next. Now, for a more aspirational recommendation, uh, as I said before, if we truly are serious about um, addressing these glo huge global challenges, whether it's climate or whether it's um, Unequal access, unequal access to health commodities, there needs to be a serious discussion around transformation of international health governance to align with the international health and human rights framework. We must make anti-racism a central pillar of the revival of health and human rights and accelerate decolonization of health by empowering representatives from low and middle income countries to be part of the conversation, to be represented in committees and undertake reforms in global governance, as I said, to ensure um, this equitable representation. Next. We must address discrimination and stru structural barriers to health for groups who are devalued or marginalized. Each day we hear of examples, both small and large, of uh, many of these discrimination and structural barriers that prevent people from coming forward and enjoying some of the advances that we've seen in um, science and health. And 
to really address these structural barriers, we have to undertake systematic review and reform existing laws and policies that lead to discrimination and human, and human rights violations and repeal criminal laws that are inconsistent with health and well-being, whether it's same-sex relations, sex work, transgender identity, or possession of drugs for personal use. At the same time, we have to look at enacting laws and policies to ensure that non-citizens have access to the same level and quality of health services as, as, as citizens. And we have uh, in the report outlined the legal policy and programmatic changes that are needed across all the eight domains that we have discussed in the commission. Next. Both Richard and Chris spoke about accountability and one of our recommendations is to strengthen accountability by developing international standards to assess progress on reducing racism and discrimination as fundamental causes of health inequities. And we must put in place systematic monitoring and reporting on health, social and economic outcomes amongst marginalized or underserved populations and use this data to guide policy and programmatic responses to close disparities and gaps. Next. And finally, to address the um, commercial determinants of health that, are, um, that we see um, uh, impede, again, um, equal access to medicines um, and other health commodities, we must implement policies to ensure that corporations align their ESG obligations to the full array of human rights issues, including climate justice, anti-racism, gender equality, and commercial determinants of health. Thank you. Over to you, Chris. Yes. Thank you so much, Adiba, and um, I think uh, there's a, a really decades of work to be done uh, to make all these uh, recommendations realized, but uh, I think we've all agreed on just how central uh, they are. Uh, we're now going to uh, have a panel um, uh, of some uh, folks who were uh, asked to join and speak uh, to the outcomes of the Commission. Uh, and that panel will be uh, moderated by Pam Das, who I just saw a moment ago. Um, Pam, do, do come back on camera. There you are. <laughs> and Pam, uh, for those of you who don't know her, is the associate editor. That's it. Uh, she has been in that role for a number of years. And she has, for a number of years, been uh, the Lancet's lead editor on the special issues and on the commissions. She's done extraordinary work in that way. We've been working together since uh, 2008 is my count. And, and uh, so that has been wonderful and rewarding. Um, so Pam, over to you and... Uh... Great, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Adiba. Um, and thanks to all of you who've joined us um, today. Um, so the next sort of part of this launch event is going to be um, getting some reflections really from some external speakers and panelists whose work um, in one way or another, uh, human rights plays a huge role. And really to hear from them some of their perspectives on the report so that we can then open it up uh, to you, the audience, and have a sort of wider discussion um, about the possible actions that, that we really need to, to get going on to renew uh, this global commitment to these um, critical principles that are, are central to this report. So um, just before I introduce the speakers, um, please do think up some questions 
uh, and put them in the Q&A chat. We are going to open up the floor. So this is your opportunity to really kind of challenge some of the things we say in the report. And um, and also, given the um, quality of the speakers and panelists we have here, an opportunity to really have um, a discussion um, on some of your um, thoughts and concerns. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to um, hand it over to the speakers. So uh, we will have three commentators. We'll have Slim Abdul Karim, who's um, from South Africa. But he's currently joining us uh, from, from the US. Rajat Kosler, who's at the University of Malaysia, and Parvin Palmer, who's from California in the US. Now, each of them um, have different day jobs and um, are sort of coming at this report from their perspective um, and some of their experiences that they've encountered um, over the last few years. So if I could just hand over to, let's say, the first person I can see here is Palm, uh, Parveen. Over to you. Thanks. Sure, thank you so much, Pam. Um, and thank you to the commission for putting together this incredible report. Um, it is uh, really remarkable, uh, the breadth of this work and, and the thoughtfulness of this work. And so I just really greatly appreciate uh, this coming out and certainly couldn't be more timely, as Chris said, um, you know, so many of these issues have um, really become critically important, uh, particularly given the breadth of conflict um, and um, uh, displacement and, uh, and human rights violations in so many contexts and specifically within the context of the pandemic. I think for me, one thing that, um, that I've been doing reading this report and listening to this presentation is thinking about um, the reactions of those that we work with, those that we advocate for as, as human rights activists and health providers. So the patients here in Los Angeles, um, you know the um, the people that we've worked with um, that I've worked with uh, in you know displaced by conflict um, uh, you know in a variety of settings those that are detained in ICE detention facilities across the United States um, immigrants that are that are detained in the U.S. Um, for seeking asylum often under which is of course a guaranteed right under international law um, and a couple of things come to mind um, you know, the first is that. Um, you know, I really appreciate that this report highlights that these principles cannot be acted on in isolation. You know, that this is something that has to involve a broad team of, um, you know, engagement with policymakers, economists, activists, and I think centrally community as well. Um, you know, and this is something that as health providers, we, we strive to do, and I think, uh, you know, really could certainly do better, um, you know, kind of broadly. Um, and I think, you know, human rights has always been, um, you know, the language of human rights is something that is so critically important. Um, but I think it's one that we as a community could do a better job of making relevant and understandable to people from different communities. Um, and so that's something that I would I would really love to hear a little bit more about thoughts on that from my, my colleagues as well. Um, you know, human rights frameworks are are kind of uh, distant in some ways, but really should be um, a part of our human language. Our, you know, no matter who you are and where you're from, it should be something that you're sort of well aware of these rights and how they apply to you. Um, the language around accountability, I think, resonates with all of us. So many of us have seen, uh, you know, particularly with the events uh, of today, um, you know, when I'm thinking about the... Um, you know, uh, horrible, um, you know, human rights violations. Chris and I have worked on many of these issues in and around Myanmar um, and that accountability still um, is lacking for many of these events. So that certainly is critically important. And how do we, how do we drive that global conversation? Um, but accountability, not only for those larger events, but also for the impacts of inequalities and structural racism and, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of the, the the everyday ways in which human rights violations impact people's lives. So thinking about the COVID pandemic, you know, certainly the, this report does a really nice job of laying out um, the ways in which um, inequalities and uh, sort of, you know, profit motives um, of, uh, you know, corporations and pharma sort of really harmed uh, the health of, of our planet in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and I think about, you know, my work in Los Angeles as an emergency physician, seeing patients 
coming in with COVID. You know, early on, these were people that were from the, um, uh, you know, frontline workers. And so really people that were quite vulnerable. So anyway, all of that, uh, just to say, I appreciate all of that. Um, and that's that's my initial reaction. Thank you so much. I'm on mute. Thank you very much, Parveen. If I can now hand over to Rajat in Malaysia. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, and, uh, and let me start by adding my congratulations to the co-chairs and, uh, and to all the 23 commissioners uh, for, for this spectacular report. And as many have already pointed out, its timeliness and importance uh, cannot be overstated. And almost 30 years after John Hanman started the FXP Center at, uh, at Harvard and called for a health and human rights approach, I think we, we, are, we are in unprecedented times uh, for a variety of reasons, not least because nobody is really using a human rights-based approach to address the kind of challenges that we are talking about. Um, there's much to be said and unpacked about the report, but the perspective that I want to briefly zero in on is a perspective that the report draws in from multiple intersecting crises, which many have now recently started captioning it as a poly crisis that we find ourselves in. I, however, would like to state uh, the former High Commissioner for Human Rights, Thiyat Prada Hussain, who recently said it really isn't a poly crisis, there is one crisis, and that is that of failed leadership. And I think we do need to underscore that point that the report repeatedly brings us to, through the eight domains and multiple case studies that it talks about. And a few reflections as we look at these multiple intersecting crises and what do they imply. The first is that it adds to the vulnerability for those who are already vulnerable, whether these are migrants, whether these are uh, populations who are ethnically or racially marginalized in the countries that they live in, the impact of these multiple intersecting crises on those individuals from a human rights per uh, perspective is catastrophic. Whether we look at COVID-19, we look at uh, the climate emergency, and so on and so forth, which the report very articulately puts out. The second is the issue of power and power differentials and power asymmetries, whether it is colonial power or whether it is power that is described to the extractive relationships between the global north and global south, which the multiple aspects of this report point out, but also questions, what do we do about this power and its asymmetries almost 20 plus years after the Commission on Social Determinants of Health pointed out power as a determinant of health we really haven't done much about addressing it. The third thing that stands out when we look at it from this perspective is that our institutions are failing and are failing miserably. The institutions that are meant to safeguard human rights, provide accountability, are just not able to do so. And the question we should be asking, why is that? New institutions will not necessarily solve the problem because the problem, as the report points out, is the kind of geopolitical, geoeconomic space that we find ourselves in with the rise of authoritarianism of the kind of nationalistic policies that are derailing the human rights enterprise. It's not that human rights are not working, it's that our implementation of it is what's not working. The next is the issue of crackdown of civic space. In countries after country, we are finding the voice of civil society organizations being muzzled. There is really no space for dissent or to put a contrary viewpoint in multiple societies. Many would have seen the statistics that over half of the world population is going to election this year. The consequences of those elections on those advocating for these issues on the front lines are deep and enormous. And the question we don't know how to answer is, what are we going to do about it? And two final points before I, I, I wrap up these initial reflections. The first is that the human rights enterprise is very much state-focused and state-based. We derive 
the mandate, the authority for human right from state as the ultimate duty bearer and also for enforcer of accountability. What we don't know today is how to deal with the situation where the state might be willing to do in a best case scenario, a poor human right, you know, reaffirm the kind of 75 years old obligation of UDHR, but it's not able to do that. It's not able to do that because of other competing powers that are derailing the human rights enterprise. The power of powerful private actors is something that the report very nicely brings together. But the question is, what do we do about it? And this is where the shortcomings of our frameworks need to be brought to bear. My penultimate point is one that actually Philip Austin makes, not me. Recently writing in an editorial, he talks about the increasing trend of criminalization of human rights themselves, where we are seeing an increasing trend of atrocity crimes being championed, being put forward as the core of what we want to espouse through the human rights enterprise, not the broader notions of human rights, not the social justice issues, not the deep-seated inequalities that we want to be talking about. But these atrocity crimes are what are becoming increasingly focused. And don't get me wrong, and so does Philip Austin points to this, is that we do want those atrocity crimes to be prosecuted and brought to bear, but we don't want them at the cost of broader conversation about economic justice and social equality. And my final point is that one that I think uh, from Richard's keynote presentation to everybody else has pointed out is to the collapse of independent accountability to uphold health as a human right. We simply do not have the infrastructure working to ensure that accountability, let alone provide the kind of remedies that are needed to ensure that the violations of human rights don't go unaccounted for. And this does not necessarily mean blame and punishment. This does not only mean prosecution. This means that we need to have some sort of a course correction mechanism that helps us address the lack of access, the lack of uh, equality in terms of participation and bring these issues together to ensure that we do really challenge the present status quo and reverse the trend for the crisis that we find ourselves in. Thanks a lot, Pam. Back to you. Thank you very much, um, Rajat, uh, for a very powerful response there. And maybe these are some of the issues we come back to in the Q&A. Um, and finally, if I could hand over to Slim, over to you. Thank you very much, Pam. Well, let me join my two other colleagues in congratulating the Commission on very eloquently capturing the centrality of human rights and equity for the promotion of good health. And I think they make a very strong and compelling case to illustrate that you know, to achieve a state of good health, that's not doable without respecting human rights. And I think the, the linkage is very strongly demonstrated in this report. I will comment very quickly on, uh, in, the, in this relation to this report, on the two of humanity's greatest health challenges, uh, and that is on the HIV and COVID pandemics. In HIV, we saw how time and again, situations where human rights were being deprived created the conditions for backsliding on the HIV goals and compromising our global efforts to achieve our 2030 goal of ending AIDS as a global health threat. And we're seeing that most recently in Uganda where enacted legislation on sexual orientation is depriving life-saving antiretroviral treatment to members of the LGBTI community. So, but it's not new. In HIV, right from the early days when Russia created Operation Infecton, which was a specific disinformation campaign 
around the creation of the virus, blaming the US, we began to see the role of disinformation. In my own country, in South Africa, we saw how leaders took the position of uh, uh, directly impacting and depriving people of antiretroviral treatment by saying that HIV did not cause AIDS. So we've seen that time and again in HIV, where the link between human rights and the ability to deal with HIV effectively are very strongly interlinked. In COVID-19, the situation was even stronger. We saw how global greed uh, created this unconscionable inequity in the access to biological uh, countermeasures, such as diagnostics, such as vaccines, oxygen and treatments in poor countries, especially those in Africa, were simply at the back of the queue. Wealthy countries, you know, such as Israel, were starting to give booster doses of the vaccine when most countries in Africa hadn't even received their first vaccine dose. So we are seeing how in COVID-19, there was a very strong link between the human rights efforts and the need to deal with this pandemic. And it became particularly clear when we saw how we failed as a global community to stand as one against a common enemy, where indeed, you know, the, the marshal, the, the, the general in our battle against COVID-19, the WHO, was the first to be undermined when we're trying to tackle and create a global effort and a global plan against this virus. And I think we will see over and over as social media has now uh, become so widespread that this information takes on a whole new hue that we will see. And we, be, we saw it particularly in COVID-19 where uh, disinformation was depriving people of access to essential services, essential measures. And nowhere was that more clear actually in the medical community itself, where people, doctors and healthcare workers themselves were promoting disinformation. And so this right to benefit equitably from the benefits of science, from to receive scientific I think we probably need to uh, move on until uh, he can come back. It's probably a bandwidth issue on his side. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Um, right. Well, um, so let's kind of open up the floor a bit. Um, I wondered, uh, actually, uh, while the audience is still, we have a few questions a couple lined up, um, but please do um, think of some more questions and put them in the chat. Um, if I could ask um, a question to, to you all, really, um, in terms of the, you know, the, the sort of powerful recommendations that you make and, and the point that um, Rajat spoke to around implementation you know how how do we execute what 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 i want to ask a question around the fact that what does it mean if what is the one thing you would do tomorrow um based on those recommendations from your various backgrounds and perspectives um what's the one thing that we could do that would be really could action some of the sort of findings and key messages from the report. If I could ask each of you in turn, uh, maybe Chris and Adiba, I mean, you've had some time to reflect on the report maybe in terms of, you know, what next, but what are the immediate things we can do? Because some of the things, as you say, are going to take quite a while to, to do. Um, but what can we do tomorrow? Well, I'm, I'm going to take the uh, co-chair's prerogative and say two things, if I can. And not just one, but two. Okay? And, and the first is that I think uh, those of us particularly who work on uh, the research side, data generation side, we really have to take the spectacular tools that have been developed in modern population-based science 
uh, the, the power of, that we have uh, across so many disciplines to bring to bear on these issues. We have got to build, to continue to build the case uh, for why, uh, why the issues we care about are relevant. And I think uh, the more that we do that and the more that we bring the voice of medicine and science to human rights, um, the, the broader our audience. I think that that, that is truly on us. Um, I'll just tell you that, for example, here at Duke, at this university, human rights is an elective. Uh, that's, that, that has to change. It has to be a part of how all, all healthcare providers, physicians, nurses uh, are trained. The second thing that I think we can really all start on today that we really have to do much better at is finding common cause with the other movements that are out there. And that, for example, the, the, there is such great energy and vigor in the climate justice movement, and particularly among young people. And it's one of the most vibrant movements, I think, that, that we see. Um, and you don't see much in the way of the connections to health uh, in that battle for climate justice. It, 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 but it is absolutely essential. That's just one example. I would say also that in, in the United States right now, the most powerful movement around health rights is around reproductive rights. And because of the assault on women's reproductive health freedom that, that we are undergoing, that has a, it's a galvanizing movement. And I think it's really important that, that healthcare be there. Uh, much of this is, there are providers fighting this fight, but there are many, many other grassroots constituencies. So that work of finding common cause with the other social movements that are taking on these issues, I think that's very fundamental. We can't stay in our silos and we can't rely, uh, as Rajat so, so astutely pointed out, on health organizations to do this for us. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Deba, is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Yeah, so I think uh, for me, it's uh, two things as well. So mainstreaming um, human rights in, in medical education, as, as Chris pointed out, uh, you know, the younger generation will need to um, be taught um, that uh, in, in, in med from medical schools, uh, because the, in a way you can't teach old dogs new tricks. So it, we have to start with um, young medical students that uh, it is a fundamental subject that they need to embrace and uh, be part of their day-to-day -day, um, uh, action with patients, with um, other organization. Secondly, and it's something I think um, which we are starting to see um, thankfully, is, um, as, as Chris said, work with other actors, in, in, in this case, specifically um, the uh, movement towards decriminalization. Um, Slim pointed out the, the opposite, that we're seeing um, increasing criminalization of, of sexual behavior, but in the space of personal um, drug use and possession, we are actually seeing some positive uh, movement. So it's imperative that the health sector um, join in um, uh, to, um, you know, have our voices heard of the detrimental effects of the war on drugs on, on health um, and human rights. So those would be two of the things that um, I would like to champion. Thank you. Slim, you're back. Good to see you. <laughs> yes, yeah, Slim, we've we've moved on to the um uh, the panel Q and A, but 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 do I hopefully we captured most of you <laughs> before we lost you. But any other points, of course, you're welcome to raise. And my my question was really to the to the group was, you know, what are the couple of things that we could do tomorrow based on the on the findings and recommendations of this report? Um, so why don't I uh, go to Parveen and um, Raja and then come come to you, Slim, on that question. Parveen. Sure. Thank you, Pam. Um, 
you know, I I come back to I think this principle of communication. So I, you know, health health uh, health actors, physicians in particular, we don't. I think I'd, I'll speak for myself. We can all get a little bit better at communicating um, uh, with community, uh, you know. And so I think of two two kind of main broad categories. I think the first is that these recommendations, and I think the commission has done a great job of of uh, starting this conversation and also putting forth some very concrete recommendations on how to do this. But the first is, you know, when we think about um, global accountability mechanisms, we know that these are you know, in dire need of, um, of um, you know, uh, improvement, right? And so this is something where we really do have to think about how do we communicate these recommendations in a way that they speak to people that differ from us. You know, many of us come from, um, you know, this principle of health is um, inherently important, you know, and rights and sort and the moral kind of the moral and ethical obligation that we have. This doesn't speak to everybody. And we just have to accept that. You know, we just have to find a way to communicate the importance of this to our, our colleagues and leaders from other um, other uh, professions. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is that, you know, particularly thinking about um, the ways in which inequalities uh, and human rights um, violations impact health for individuals and patients, um, you know, um, thinking about you know, how do we communicate this to our patients, right? This is something that we are, we need to get better about, or how do we communicate this to our communi communities in a way that they can then use this language to advocate for themselves? And also how can we start to really become a profession uh, and, a, and as researchers and health providers, how can we really begin to meaningfully partner with community on these issues? Because, you know, we know now that this, that a top-down approach doesn't really work, right? And so many of the of the most the the largest gains in health and rights have come from communities. And so this is just something I think that we really need to get better at. Yeah, yeah, great point. Thanks, Harvey. Rajat. Thanks, Pam. Um, just adding to 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 what uh, colleagues have said, three quick things. One. Uh, I would start by arguing that we need to invest more at the local level. Um, we have had not only dwindling of funding over the years, but complete vanishing of funding. But, and there's a recent study which points to while the global north, we are seeing a retrenchment of narrative on human rights. We are actually seeing some massive successes on human rights-based approaches in global south. And we need to be able to capture that, and we cannot do that, let alone amplify that, without investment in these issues at the local level where the action is happening. The second point I would like to make is this reclaiming the narrative and changing the narrative, if I may take a cue from where Praveen left us. Paul Farmer very famously said, if health is a human right, the question we need to be answering is, who is human enough to have that right? And there has been a systemic dehumanization of rhetoric that has happened, whether it is migrant, whether it is ethnic minorities, or whatever. And we need to change this narrative. We need to be able to tell a better story for what we know needs to happen. And then finally, I do have to say, um, somebody pointed out this recently to me because, you know, as this topic has an external reality today seems to be, there's a lot of emphasis that comes on a hope-based narrative. And the person actually turned to me, it's not hope that you want, it's courage that you want. It's courage to do what you want as a health worker, as somebody working on human health and human rights, to stand up for science, to stand up for evidence, and to be ready to fight for it. And I think that's what we are missing somewhat because we pretend that this is a problem out there or somebody else to fix. This is a problem. This is happening within. And the reason we are not seeing health being championed as a human right, because we as health workers do not espouse of it as one, because as somebody very nicely put forward, is because you know we're too scared of the political undercurrents that come with it. So those are my three suggestions. Thank you, Rajat. Um, Slim, anything else you'd like to add? <laughs> You're the last, so it's a bit difficult for you. 
Well, I think for me, I would like to go back to actually the first box in the report. Mm. And for me, particularly point that the report starts off with boxes on the deprivation of human rights in South Africa under apartheid and in Gaza. And those are two glaring examples of how violations of rights have impacted health, deprives nations of their humanity, and instills in us some of the most inept situations. But having you know personally lived through a fighting for health and human rights under apartheid, I thought that when we when we go back to what Archbishop Tutu said. And he pointed out very early on the importance of international opinion. That when, when we lose that moral position, that we are down a slippery slope. And indeed, one of his most famous sayings of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and he used to say very forcefully, that if you are mute, in a situation of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. So it's it's incumbent on all of us to find our humanity and to stand up for it. And in many ways, it's really reflecting on South Africa's uh, state of good wonder. President Mandela and Archbishop Tutu very vociferously promoted this idea that I am because you are, that we are part and parcel of the community, where it fundamentally challenges this notion of me first to us first. And that for me is part and parcel of the change we need to be promoting. And as difficult as it is, we've got to find all of us who have common cause to stand together and promote us Thank you. Thank you, Slim. Um, that's great reflections from all of you. Um, we have a few good questions uh, have come in. So um, a few of them, they're not quite specific to any particular individual. So perhaps if you feel you'd like to respond, you just can, I don't know, show your hand um, up um, when I read them. So uh, First question, um, are there any proven strategies for improving health-related human rights in authoritarian countries? Any experience of that? That might have been a hard one. <laughs> I don't know. I, I will say uh, there there have been, I think, some really extraordinary innovations uh, that I would really call attempts to realize the right to health um, that have stepped aside from the control of nation states. And I'm thinking very specifically about the cross-border health efforts Parveen and I have both been involved with, um, with uh, ethnic groups uh, providing services, say, from the Thai side of the Thai-Burma or Thai-Myanmar border. Um, uh, the Magsai Sai prize winner, Dr. Cynthia Mong, has been really a leader in this, developing interventions, providing, for example, maternal child care, uh, uh, safe obstetric care in conflict zones uh, by using mobile medics uh, and teams going in. Um, and, uh, and, and running programs as diverse as childhood immunizations and malaria control, uh, really important innovations um, in, in a highly authoritarian regime. But it's always been very difficult to do that work because, for example, uh, uh, from, from many donors and funders' sides, uh, the, the, the principle of national sovereignty uh, is, a, is a major block. Well, uh, you know, if you are at war with, with an ethnic group, um, uh, national sovereignty does not give you the right to discriminate and deny access to health care to a persecuted minority. Uh, and, and that principle of human rights has always run counter to... Um, to national sovereignty, internationalism, 
But nevertheless, there I think there are many examples of how it can be done. This, you know, was was really the origin in some ways of Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, providing healthcare services in Afghan during the Soviet in Afghanistan, uh, and uh, you know, it, it, there there. There are times where uh, the rights of, of individuals and communities in conflict really have to trump national sovereignty. We're going yep. to realize the right to health care. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Slim. Just to say, uh, having lived in yeah. a situation where the state was even sponsoring yeah. Uh, yeah. cardiologists yeah. like or to develop biology weapons to control the black population. I've lived under that exact situation. And for me, you know, every one of us in that situation had to stand up and be counted. And we all played our role. But it wasn't that it was done alone. It had to be done in the context of support. I mean, you think now to the AAAS and their, you know, report on mental health in South Africa, Positions for Human Rights and their delegation to South Africa, all of those reports, in fact, several uh, documents and reports, even in the Lancet, all play the role. Every little piece in the puzzle contributes to breaking down some authoritarian machines. And so I say that that's part and parcel of our role, and that's why this report is so important. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, this next question is responding to sort of Rajat's comment about institutions and the failure of them. Um, um, we have, uh, well, we'd like you to answer, and this speaks to everybody else as well on the panel. Um, how do you think institutions are equipping future leaders to understand and lead the world to better centralise human rights in legal frameworks and leadership in the face of the compounding, the poly crisis, as you, as you described it? What does what do you and others uh, perceive as being the greatest threat to not realising this need? Um. So let me answer it in two parts, uh, and let's take the first one first, uh, which is in terms of what are the institutions doing in terms of addressing the kind of compounding of crisis uh, and, and then another bits that you're doing and preparing the future leaders. Um, I think very little and very poorly, if I may be self-critical right now. Um, and, and I think a lot of this gets down to the fact that these are institutions that are weighed down very heavily by the member states that govern them and the politics that we have uh, within the system uh, right now within multilateralism basically is a perfect recipe for a policy paralysis that you really cannot look at big strides being made to address the kind of challenges that we're making. We are lucky if you're making baby steps right now uh, around some of these things. So I think be as it may, the question is what is being done and where are some of the green shoots that one can take aspiration from. I think for me, one of the big things that needs to be done and that has been done very well over the last two decades is demystifying what do we mean by health as a human right? What would it mean beyond a bumper sticker call for that you know, right to health? Uh, and and be, be jargonizing it and breaking it down, and which kind of goes back to the previous question on where it might work, even within authoritarian regimes, is then we are able to explain what am I you know, getting on about? Um, and the fact that we have not only been able to demonstrate the good example of Jammu Command 14, which is almost 25 years old now, but also through subsequent interpretations and unpacking of the right. But today we have tools and tactics which go a long way in terms of measuring impact. The fact that we have demonstrated case studies that show where rights were integrated in health programming, there is not only a positive gain, but a sustainable gain over a period of time goes a long way to breaking it down. We need more of that. We need more of those lessons and we need more of those lessons to be projected at a global scale to see how we take what is erstwhile a boutique enterprise to scale 
and we don't have the capacity right now to break this into doing it at scale. And of course, one cannot be naive for everything that has been said thus far. Um, I, I, I feel somewhat that there are opportunities that are glaring at us in our faces right now, which are which which are not uh, you know a, a big bang moment, but which are small but spectacular gains. Whether it is in terms of how do we address uh, issues in terms of reproductive rights by linking it with a justice-oriented approach and therefore looking at reproductive justice as a framework. So bringing different frameworks, different taxonomies together to argue this out gives us more impetus, but importantly, it gives us more credence at the local level because we are then looking at building a more social movement approach to, to, to win this eventually. Yeah, that's great, great points. Thanks, Rajat. Um, right, another couple of questions, if I can fit them in. Um, we have uh, disinformation. So that was one of the, um, you know, major domains that we added sort of later on in the commission um, as a result of our concerns around misinformation and disinformation. Uh, so panellists, how do we deal with the vast amount of disinformation and the way that it is increasingly shaping national legislation? Uh, would anyone like to take that? I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in briefly. Um, oh, I think sure. That, so <laughs> I, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that we and, and I, I feel a bit like a broken record, but I really do think one of the one of the core pieces of this and moving forward human rights is is trust, right? And and as a health profession, as health as health actors, um, we can come off very lectury, right? We can come off, you know, in in a way that we are, you know, sort of, um, you know, we're the experts and listen to us. And I'm, I'm again, I feel like I'm stating the obvious, but I think it's really critically important that we actually start to use language that people can understand. Um, I think when there are people that, you know, um, I, th I think engaging in the producers of disinformation, the consumers of disinformation in a more respectful way, um, it's, you know, it's in it is really critically important. And this is something that, you know, I sort of see routinely in clinical practice. Um, you know, and again, I think making these messages understandable to people is really critically important. And that's not something that we do a great job of. So those would be my, my initial thoughts. Um, and I guess the the final thing I would say is that um, you know, we're thinking about um, institutions and the ways in which institutions can be more responsive to human rights. You know, we're seeing, um, you know, I, I come from an educational institution, obviously, and we're seeing a chilling of conversation around rights um, because it's being politicized and people that stand up for the basic right to health in a, in a myriad of ways are being punished on, on you know, academic campuses across across certainly my country and I think across the world. And I think, you know, the bringing, bringing the health lens is one, um, one way to combat it because it is something that we can all kind of, um, I think, agree on from an objective stance, so. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thanks, Marvin. Okay, quickly gonna fit, squeeze one more in. Um, can the panel expand more on the commercial determinants and related recommendations in the commission? For example, how does the commission want to see accountability and action from corporations, particularly in HIV AIDS and addressing inequalities in access to innovative treatment and ultimately in achieving the 2030 goal? And I suppose that question also reflects on the current process that's going on with the pandemic accord, uh, which, as you know, uh, much discussion and debate on the wording of that and responsibilities uh, if we were to have another pandemic. Um, anybody would like to talk about that? Well, I would say this this was a, a an aspect of the commission's work that a number of the commissioners felt very passionately about and that um, began really with a discussion of kind of the current neoliberal structures uh, and the ways in which so much of the decision making in health and healthcare has been moved into the private sector uh, and into the corporate sector. And of course, health now is an enormously big business. 
Um, but we also realized it was really important to look at some of the other commercial determinants that also were having a huge impact on health. And a, a great example uh, of those is uh, food. Uh, so, you know, we are uh, uh, cutting uh, vitally important rainforest resources for palm oil, monoculture plantations. And palm oil is used in processed foods because it doesn't degrade, uh, but it is very unhealthy. Uh, those foods are very unhealthy. They are uh, replacing traditional and indigenous foods in all kinds of places that are much healthier. Uh, the same thing is true of sugar, right? So sugar is another monoculture where there's an enormous infrastructure and, and, uh, and we have seen extraordinary rates of diabetes, uh, particularly in Central and South America, that are really a result of a massive promotion of uh, sugary drinks. So uh, these are, don't on the surface of it appear necessarily to be rights issues, but they are. They're fundamental rights issues because these are harmful products uh, and these are powerful extra state entities very often who are able to get governments to allow uh, the sale. We understood this many years ago with tobacco uh, and the analogy wrong with, with tobacco uh, and that in fact promotion of tobacco, particularly with children, really is a, a health rights violation. Uh, but we're seeing so many of the same things in, in commercial food. And of course, that is inextricable from the complexities of climate because these are almost all monoculture, agricultural crops uh, that are also very damaging to land use, traditional livelihoods. So um, yeah, this, this I think is, is a really critical area and it's one uh, you know, that you can't really take on by sort of trying to improve diabetes care for one diabetic after another, when what's really happened is that there's an enormous epidemic of handling, really, uh, yes. driven by big sugar. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Is Eva quickly and slim? Yeah, if I, if I may jump into that, I think um, as, as pointed out um, in a recent New York Times article, this, this is a, a, a particularly difficult, um, you know, challenging area. But the palm oil, for, for example, Chris, uh, in, in Malaysia, is the livelihood for, um, you know, many people. So how the, the, the difficulties, how do you balance um, the, you know, the need course uh, to to look at the uh, impact it has on on climate on on the environment etc but at the same time it's not just in Malaysia in, in many countries in the region or if you take other crops um, that um, uh, raises these controversies how how do governments how do um, you know multilateral institutions deal with the very fact that these this um, agriculture products also mean the livelihoods of, of um, the people who work in them. So it's um, not uh, a straightforward uh, discussion. Yeah. Um, Pam, very briefly, if I may, I know we are running out of time. Um, so just two, two quick things. One is that this precise conversation point to the paucity of our frameworks, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights don't go far enough to enforce accountability and the need for a binding treaty becomes extremely important and paramount. The second is that we do need to look at the role of private sector in all its complexities in global health right now, not just in terms of the role of industry and, and in terms of production of countermeasure, but also the role of private philanthropic foundations and also issues in terms of tax and fiscal policy measures, which complicate the whole conversation around commercial determinants to the level that we do need to have unique solutions to address the challenges. Yeah, very good points. Slim, did you want to quickly add anything? We're running out of time. In fact, we're over. Oh, I think we might have, I think Slim. I'll just make one quick point. Yes, please do, quick. Just to say that 
you know, in, in many countries that we've been looking at, government has to stand together with civil organizations and stay firm against corporate interest, whether it's on food labeling or it's a, we have a sugar tax on beverages or on salt regulation. So there's a need for government intervention. And that occurs because there's civil action. And those together can achieve many of the things we've done. Yeah, agree. Great. Thank you for a very stimulating and interesting discussion. Um, Chris, if I can hand over to you to say, to close for the webinar today. Yes, absolutely. Once again, I'd like to thank all the panelists. I'd like to thank the commissioners, of course, my wonderful co-chair, uh, Prof. Adiba, um, who's been such a, a stalwart leader in this area. Let me say there will be several follow-on events. Uh, we we're, we're doing a, um, a special uh, um, symposium at the International AIDS Conference. Uh, that will be this summer, July, in Munich, Germany, where we will focus specifically on the HIV sexual uh, and reproductive rights uh, components of the report. So that will be launched there. The actual paper version of the report, the the uh, it's it's live on the Lancet website. Uh, the paper uh, comes out next Friday. Is that right, Pam? It's April seventh. Well, it's already out. It's already out. Oh, it's already out. Uh, oh, great. Wow. Yes, it came it came out on Friday. Um, and, yeah. Sorry, I'll put a, the link in. Can yeah, someone put a, the link in. Adiba is doing a session on the report at the regional World Health Assembly in Australia. Maybe you want to just uh, give the dates for that, Adiba. So that will be on April 22nd, and Rajat will, has also kindly agreed to be on the panel um, of that one. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, and we will... Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, I should say we're also having a community forum um, as part of that launch, bringing in, you know, communities from various um, marginalized communities in and around um, Melbourne to, to have their reflections on what this report means to them. Wonderful. And with that, of course, once again, our thanks to The Lancet for this extraordinary platform, uh, Pam, Richard, um, it's, it's always challenging. Uh, it's always uh, intellectually, um, I think, uh, a, a heavy lift, uh, but it's always worth it. And, uh, and we, we think the editorial standards and the platform really matter. Uh, and you really, really help so many uh, get these vital issues out to, to the uh, reading public, to the medical community. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone.